If you have your Bibles, turn with us, please, to Matthew 5. <clears throat> Matthew 5. Had someone mention uh, to me today, they appreciated the update on the chicken down at the end of Cupboard Bridge Road. We, uh, down at the end of this road, Covered Bridge Road, there's a chicken that has taken up residence. We've watched it just grow up. It just lives there at the stop sign. And uh, we don't know who it belongs to. Pastor Schaefer acts like he's going to steal it. And tonight, Paul Zeckman said he's thought about taking it. And doesn't belong to either one of them. And uh, it's just been fun to watch it. And I want to give you an update that when I came to church this evening, it was still there. Now, what, who does that sound like? It's so scary. <laughs> I was with my dad in a camp meeting for, uh, down in North Carolina. He was the evan one evangelist, and I was the other evangelist. <laughs> and it's a wonder the camp meeting didn't close, but as far as I know, they opened up for another year. There was an older lady there, good folks that I've, I knew, uh, and this, this is at camp meetings. You, you, there's normally one or two of these. Uh, this was a uh, three-wheel bicycle, and of course, you know, the bicycle had all the bells and whistles on it, rear view mirrors and turning signals and all this. I don't know about turning signals, but it had a lot of stuff, and in the basket in the front, and <clears throat> this couple would come to tabernacle each night with their, it, as I recall, actually, it was a two-seater. Uh, they both would pedal their way to the tabernacle. And in the basket uh, was a, uh, a dog. And uh, they would come to the tabernacle with their dog. And it was doors, it was on this side. These doors were open. And of course, it was open tabernacle, and these doors, and they would come here and they would park their uh, two-seater bicycle with the basket right there, out there, and they'd sit right here so they could keep their eye on the dog and the dog would stay in the basket. And of course, we could all see the dog also. And my father, for all 10 days of that camp meeting, that provided his sermon material, that dog. You know, if he ever got in the brush, he would just look out at the dog. You know, you can just see it. And, uh, oh my. And now I'm talking about the chicken. <laughs> A lady even came to me recently in the last couple of weeks, said, you know, you're starting to really look like your dad. <laughs> well, Matthew chapter 5. And I love my dad, nothing against my dad, but uh, he's a unique specimen. <laughs> Matthew chapter 5, if you're able, stand with us, please, for the reading of God's Word. It is an honor to have all of you here. It means so much uh, to have you come. And let's trust that the Lord will help us now as we look into His precious Word. And um, uh, Matthew chapter 5 is another one of those very special chapters. And, of course, we know that uh, we've titled them Be the Beatitudes in the first part of that chapter. Every one of them are good. But I want to focus our attention on verse 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we ask for your special help tonight. Move among us and accomplish your purpose through the preaching of the word. For all that you do, we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. There are uh, many questions about life and religion and serving God. And we face here at the church because uh, we haven't come up with any things. It's just that we haven't dropped a bunch of stuff like a lot of churches have done. Uh, I go to, when I go to Geisinger, there's a church right on the right-hand side. When you, when you drive by, it's full of rainbows, rainbow flag. I'm talking about a church. On their church bus is a rainbow. And we know what the rainbow was for. It was for, it was a sign from God in the sky uh, that there would be no more rain that would totally flood the earth. But that's not what that church, they're not preaching about Noah this Sunday. That church 
is corrupt in every way, shape, and form. They've thrown away everything. And they're actually a church promoting, um, promoting immorality to its furthest extent. And uh, to me, it is blasphemous. It's blasphemous the way uh, churches have... But how in the world did they get there? They get there by throwing away uh, things from the Word of God. And so we get accused of legalism when, bless your heart, we didn't write these things or come up with these things. We answer questions about legalism as if we're legalists. Uh, and, and of course, we've had some, and there may have been one or two here tonight, as there may be in any Baptist church, Episcopalian church, Presbyterian church, Roman Catholic church, or uh, whatever kind of church. Um, I think, though, that we've got to keep it straight that it all boils down to this, that to get to heaven, to walk with God, to be a Christian, you'll have to be hungry. You'll have to be thirsty. A slight hunger, a scarcely noticeable thirst will not do. The desire to serve Christ must consume us. Let me say, first of all, there must first be a deep desire to know him. I'm not talking about a creed, and I'm not talking about some kind of dress code. I'm not talking about an association with a particular denomination, not talking about a doctrinal structure. But I'm just saying there must be in your heart a deep desire to know Jesus. How do you really get to know someone? Well, you talk together. Um, communication, cell phone, walkie-talkies, two-way radios. I don't know how you communicate, but uh, when, we, when we get to know Jesus, we talk with him. We, we communicate with him. We pray. We call it prayer, but that's communicating with Jesus. You talk together. You do things together. How do you get to know, really get to know someone? You do things together. And so we do things with Jesus. We, we go where he wants us to go. We come to church when the doors are open. If this has become a hard thing where service after service and Sunday after Sunday and year after year, you know, it's, a, it's like pulling teeth to get you to the house of God, then, um, then you, it's not a matter of legalism. We don't want you to have to come. We want something in your heart that loves Jesus enough that, that you want to come. I believe I'm speaking to those kind of people. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here on a Sunday night. And I thank God for it. Even our newly married couple, the first Sunday after their honeymoon, are in church on a Sunday night. Can I hear a praise the Lord? You talk together. You do things together. You spend time together. I wonder how much quality time we're spending with the Lord. Um, it's a microwave society. Everything's done in an instant, but you don't microwave a relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, you learn to know them. You talk together, you do things together, you spend time together, you learn to know them. You read what he wrote, you study what he said, what he looks like through the portrait of his word. Uh, we, um, we're hungry, we're thirsty to really know him. I was talking to Lewis Ray Hoover one day, and this would be uh, Lewis Ray and Merle, their background, and they were talking, Lewis Ray was talking about a circle letter that he wrote, or something he'd read in the circle letter. I said, what in the world is a circle letter? Well, how many know what a circle letter is? Oh, lots of people. Uh, lots of people. And uh, how many participate in a circle letter right now? Ah, uh, the whole row back there, the Merle Hoover family raised their hand. I'm so happy to know you still do it. So, large family, and, uh, and so, now if I get this wrong, Merle, please correct me. In fact, you could come up and tell us about it. But you, uh, it starts with, who does it start with in your family, or does it just keep going round and round? Keeps going round and round. By now, a whole UPS truck stops at your front door to let out the circle letter in many boxes for many years. I don't know. But anyway, it just goes round and round. The deal is, is the first person writes what they're doing, you know, uh, what they're doing, what they're involved in, you know, how many, how many jars of uh, peaches they canned and, and how, how many, uh, you know what I mean? You write all this information. And then that goes to the next person in the family. And they read that, and then they write what they're doing. 
you know? And then, and then uh, it goes to the next person. It just goes all the way around until it comes back to the person who started it all, and they get to read everything. And then I guess by then, new things have happened. <laughs> and so you're right. And you just keeps going round and round. Isn't that a good idea? I'll tell you. Wouldn't take real long to get around our family because it'd get to Jameson. He wouldn't send, write anything or send anything. You're just fortunate to hear from him. <laughs> Do we really want to know about Jesus? Are we hungry to know him? Are we thirsty to know him? Not only there must there be a deep desire to know Christ, but I was thinking there must be a deep desire to be like Christ. For this we seek the fullness of the Holy Spirit, who will fashion us into Christ's likeness. 2 Corinthians 3, but we all with open face, beholding as in the glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. You know, I heard it said that Brother Schmuel's favorite verse, Brother Harold Schmuel's favorite verse was Colossians 1.18. He was a great preacher among us for many years in heaven now. And ever since I heard that, I underlined it in my Bible. And I've gotten myself a new Bible, and I underlined it again to, tonight in this Bible. I got myself a, newer, a new Bible because uh, my old Bible I had used for so many years that the words were getting really small. And so I got myself a new Bible, and I, um, I, I uh, underlined it in this Bible, uh, Colossians 1.18. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, the longer I live, I don't really care uh, if I'm known as the pastor of this church. This is a great church. It's been the honor of my life to serve here. I don't really care if I have some position or title or whatever, 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 or degrees after my name, though I know all of you wish that I would learn something. And I'm a candidate, really, if I could pass the class. But this right here, ladies and gentlemen, is honestly what the desire of my heart is tonight. I love Brother Schmuel's favorite verse, Colossians 1.18, these words in that verse, that in all things he might have the preeminence. You know, nothing else matters tonight. Nothing else matters. But that he has the preeminence in my life. I, um, I want to stay hungry and thirsty. While I don't agree at all that our people are a bunch of legalists, I do agree that certain groups have certain dangers. And so our group could have the danger of resting in the things we do or don't do. And the things we do and don't do and have believed across many years are based on Scripture. I believe in them with all of my heart. I am, if, if we would leave this church, my wife and I, if we would leave this church and move to California and live on the seaside and retire the rest of our life watching the, at the ocean, watching the waves roll in. If I know my heart, there is not one thing that I would change about the way we live. We're not doing it for the church. So I believe in this with all of my heart. But ladies and gentlemen, the danger that we have, and I'm talking to us, so that's why I'm saying, the danger that we have is to rest in the do's and the don'ts and quit being thirsty and hungry after God. 
Until in our conversations, Jesus never comes up. Until our conversations, maybe we can spend a whole meal together and Jesus never even comes up. We can spend a whole evening together and, and the scriptures that we've been reading never come up. And we can be in a wonderful service and walk out and talk about the weather and Joe Biden and coronavirus and politics and the price of hay and the gas prices. And Jesus never comes up. And we can just live our days and we're keeping the do's and the don'ts. And I want you to, bless your heart, if you want to discourage the pastor, start discarding those things. It kills me every time. We believe in the do's and the don'ts. But I want to tell you something. If we, if we lose the hunger and the thirst after a relationship with Jesus Christ, that he's first, one of the things that thrilled me about the testimonies tonight we were singing about heaven, and I love that. I was thinking about how many in the chorus book are about heaven. We're a people headed to heaven, so we sing about it, we testify about it, we're excited about it. But it thrilled me with the testimonies tonight, even in talking about loved ones that we long to see. It always came back to, isn't it going to be something to see Jesus? To see Jesus who died for us, who saved us, who's been so faithful to us. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, thank God for the do's and don'ts, but let's never lose the hunger and the thirst. May Jesus be first. May he come up in our conversations. Are we still, are we still talking about him? Are we still thinking about him? Are we still singing about him? Are those the songs in our mind? Are those the things that come over our radio dial? Is that, the, is that what we're listening to the songs about Jesus. Is, is that what we're still putting up on our wall? You know, I'm, I just like, I remember the old saints, you'd go in to see them and they had mottos up on the wall and scripture verses up on the wall. And then it seemed like we went through a time where that was old fogey. And uh, we never even thought about that for decor. Oh, I thank God in recent years, they're doing a great job, aren't they? Bringing back scriptures. You go over there to where's that place in Mifflinburg? You go over there to that place. Uh, Mennonite folks, uh, friends, I believe, uh, run it. Good Christian people, and they run that store over there. What's the name of that? Housewares place. Keystone Housewares. I'm telling you what, you go in there. And you look at all those inscriptions and pictures and paintings. Your house can be beautiful and it can be adorned with good scripture. You may come in from a hard day of work and be so discouraged and look at that and that'll cheer you up. Amen. You say, you're really meddling, you're just like your dad. Well, let me tell you, let me tell you this. I'm very concerned about this. I'm very concerned the world thinks we ought to be talking about Jesus. When they see how we look and know that we go to church not only on Sunday morning, we go to church Sunday night. We go to church Wednesday night. I mean, your neighbors, they know when revival's on, <laughs> I mean, every night of the week. And so you know what? They have a right they have a right to think that we're going to talk about Jesus. And you know, in little ways, I've, I've been trying more and more when people ask me at Walmart or where else, how, how are you? I've been trying more and more just to say, I'm blessed. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to stare at somebody every time and, and tell them they're going to go to hell if they don't know Jesus. I'm not talking about that kind of witnessing. But you know, we can just learn to talk more and more about our Lord. The deep desire of the Christian is to not only know Christ, but to pattern our entire life after him. Christian means to be like little Christ, to be a copy, to be a photocopy of his image. This cannot happen without being hungry and thirsty, without being filled with his spirit, 
Without the fullness of the Spirit, we'll find ourselves continually drawn away to other patterns. The patterns of this world. The patterns of ungodly friends. The patterns of worldly relatives. I wish I could illustrate this the way I mean it. I, 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 there's an illustration that comes to me. These people may even be watching this service because... These people love Beavertown Church. They're, they've hardly ever been here, maybe once or twice. They're in a distant state. And I have absolute confidence in them. They're extremely good people. They don't keep every one of our standards. They've not drifted to that spot. They've never had any of them. They have actually come closer and closer and closer to where we would stand tonight uh, through the influence of IHC and attending the services and being so... Uh, burdened about the direction of their church that has gone after contemporary music and you know you go to church and it's just more like a disco uh, I don't know it's more like a bar you feel like some churches I've walked into for certain occasions and I felt guilty for being there and then I realized well this is a church but it looked more like a place like God would save you out of um, so they they really love the Lord and they're not interested in that. And uh, so they heard about, about, about our people. And so they started coming around. And they just, keep, they just have kept coming and coming. And the, uh, they're wonderful people. And in conversation, uh, she told me, you know, the thing that was really rough for us was that, you know, we had... Uh, you know, we wanted everything God wanted for us, and we, we, were so, we're so, we are so attracted to, you know, the, the IHC crowd, the holiness people. We are holiness people, but we had never known that there was a conservative holiness people. We thought we were the only ones that believed certain things, and, and Brother Cassidy will know exactly who I'm speaking of. Um, and we... Um, she said, we, uh, we started going to the Dayton Convention and all oh, our hearts were so refreshed and we never knew there was a people like this. We never knew it. But she said, Brother Plank, the only thing that bothered us was that many of the young people, they looked good. You know, they looked like, like we, you know, our girls are starting to, to look and we believe in modesty and we believe in these things and we felt at home but she said they they looked good but as our children began to make friends with the young people we learned that many of them were no different than than the world the, you know they were all into sports figures they were all into the latest movies. I mean, this is a lady saying, you know, we, we aren't quite where you folks are, but we're coming. You know what I'm saying? Is anybody catching what I'm saying? She said, uh, you know, we don't want our children following the sports world and having heroes as ball players who desecrate the Lord's Day and gamble and drink and drugs we don't you know we don't want that as the heroes for our kids and and of course we're not interested in the movie scene and she said it's really been something to work through for our kids as we're trying to move them in a more conservative direction in a, in a direction like this when in the facts are in some of the things that really matter our kids not that these don't but if you're all dressed up and you're still hooked on, the, on your sports games in the afternoon and Sunday afternoon and, and you're still hooked up to the same movies as Hollywood and all this mess, what's the deal? So we're trying to get our kids to come this direction and, and, and yet they're more... You know, they wouldn't think of watching these movies and you go on the social media and all the kids have their favorite movies. Preachers and preachers' wives now have their favorite movies. I know there's some movies that are likely harmless, but I want to tell you something. Uh, they're not all harmless. And parents, let me just tell you, you better keep your boundaries. 
strong for your children. I've been thinking a lot about this, I've been saying it wherever I go. Uh, I, always, I believe there ought to be a, higher, uh, a, a high standard for the ministry and, their, and the family. And um, as long as Jameson and Jennifer were under our care, I did my very, very best. Uh, and I pray that they were a good example. Uh, I can't say we always got, you know, bat 100, but my desire was that we would always, that we would require of our children an example. Not to put them on a pedestal at all, but I don't want you to be disappointed in them or what I would allow. But I'll tell you, actually, Sister Loper, it was when Rodney became president of God's Bible School, and it was about the same time that Joanne came to be our associate pastor with her husband, Solomon. <laughs> gotcha, Joanne. You didn't even get it. And you know, Joanne was stricken uh, with uh, terrible health condition soon after coming to the church. And, and I didn't know the Lopers real well, brother and sister Loper Sr., uh, real well. And, and Joanne was in the hospital very seriously ill for a long time. And, uh, and uh, during that time, the Lopers came out, brother and sister Loper, of course, brother Loper's in heaven now. But uh, brother and sister Loper came out and uh, got to visit with them. And they pro she probably doesn't remember me saying this, but here we are. They've been precious lay people across many years, just like most everybody here tonight. You know, sitting in churches, part of the uh, leadership of the church, teaching Sunday school, whatever they did. And um, I looked at them and I said, I just want to say thank you. You were lay people that were willing to think God may want to use my kids. And so we're going to be careful in some things. It's not just the preacher's job. We're going to be careful in some things. And guess what? Your son just became president of our largest Bible college. And your daughter is now a pastor's wife in our church. I'm so thankful. Am I making any sense? I beg of our lay people. If Beavertown Church will be a force for holiness and for good and for godliness in this community, we love history. I might live, if Jesus tarries, I might live long enough to be part of the 100th celebration of this church. They'll push me in in a wheelchair and I'll get up and make a little speech in a crackly voice. Actually, it's not that far away, only about 10 years. Either way, it's not far away. <laughs> we're going to be a church that matters. It's going to take lay people willing to say, you know what? I'm going to step up and think about the fact that I may be raising a preacher. I may be raising a preacher's wife. I may be raising a church board member. I may be raising a leader in the holiness movement. I may be raising the next Leonard Robb. Leonard is a layman. He's getting older. I think, who's going to replace Leonard? It's probably somebody sitting in one of these pews. One of your kids. But if you're steering them towards the world and, and you don't care what they watch, and getting them on some team to hit a ball across a field. And, and if that's all more important than God's work, and you don't ever get your kids in an old-fashioned hole in his camp meeting where they hear the saints shout and the preachers preach, and those things are not priority to you, we won't have a church. You can call in a, you know, your next pastor will, like, will of course, do a better job than this one, but... But preachers can only do so much. We do our very best, but it's going to take lay people determine this is what we are, this is what we believe, not just for the do's and the don'ts, but because we have a hunger and a thirst in our heart 
for a holy heart and to make it to heaven, whatever the cost. I want to be like Jesus. We must like what he likes, see what he sees, think like he thinks, go where he would go, say what he would say. And I don't know all the ins and outs, ups and downs, and all the measurements and all the pages and all the stuff to answer every one of your questions and arguments, but I do know that if I'm going to be like Jesus, I'm not going to look at or entertain myself with anything or listen to anything that has to do with the stuff that nailed him to a cross. Stuff that he shed his precious blood to cover and forgive. Queen Victoria, Queen of England, in the 19th century asked a prominent businessman to take a six-month world trip inspecting vital British Empire interests. He said, but who will look after my business while I am gone? The queen quietly responded, you take care of the queen's business and the queen will take care of your business. Jesus says that to every person here. If you'll be hungry, if you'll be thirsty, this verse is a promise, you shall be filled. And I believe he looks down at us and he says, you take care of, uh, you let me, you let me take care of your family. You let me take care of your business. You let me take care of your goals. You let me take care of your pursuits. You put me first. Seek me first. God would say, you seek me first. You take care of, you let me take care of your business and I'll take care of yours. I'll promise you'll never be cheated. You'll be the gainer and not the loser. Stay hungry. Stay thirsty. Shall we stand together tonight? Father in heaven, we love thee. We thank you for the privilege to serve thee. Lord, we remember the day when you saved us, when you sanctified us. But Lord, we're much more concerned tonight about staying hungry and thirsty through whatever life brings, heartaches, ups and downs, perhaps health issues, family discouragements, church discouragements, whatever there is in our life, Lord, there's one thing. We want to keep it simple and just be hungry after you. And we love the promise that you gave us that if we'll hunger and thirst after you, if we'll hunger and thirst after righteousness, we shall be filled. We never have to leave the table empty, but we can have all of you that we want to have. Keep us true and faithful through this week. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you. You're dismissed.